Right. Hey, everybody, welcome to today's class on ground covers. We have Peg Beer with us today to cover this topic. Um, as I see the people logging in, I'm just going to go over a couple of notes. If you've been on these classes before, just bear with me. Um, for those of you who are new, welcome. Uh, this is a webinar format of Zoom, so it's a little bit different than the meetings you might have attended. We actually can't see your face. We can't hear your voice. So if you have questions during the class, you're going to look at your Zoom menu click on the Q&A button and you'll type those questions in. I understand we are packed, this class is packed with content. Um, so I'm not sure how many questions we're gonna have time to get to, but we will see what we can do. And if we can't answer your questions, then following the class, you're welcome to hit reply on that confirmation email and that will come to us. We can answer any questions following the class. We are recording today. Um, if you have any issues during the class, please feel free to just to send me a chat and let me know and uh, we'll see what we can do. So Peg, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you so you can dive in. Well, thank you very much. And I would say grab a, a pencil and paper because I didn't make an outline. And if you're interested in copying down some of these names, that would be great, okay? Um, people frequently ask me, what is your favorite plant? And I think, and I say, the one I'm standing in front of. So if you ask me, what is my favorite program to present? I think I'd have to say the same thing because as I was going through to find pictures, because a picture is worth a thousand words, I do agree with that. Um, I, it, it, this is a fascinating topic. I know it may sound a little boring, ground covers. Oh, that's narrowing the field. It really is. A, and I hope by the end of the class, if I do a decent job, that you'll say, wow, no, it is so boring. So with all that, um, we'll, we'll get started. Now, the, and I have a lot of pictures because um, that it's a very descriptive thing. Definition of a ground cover. It's anything that covers the ground. So that's pretty all inclusive, isn't it? So I'm going to say that these beds of perennials or com combinations of perennials and shrubs and et cetera, are all ground covers. And some are better at covering the ground than others. And one beauty of ground covers is that it is very helpful in keeping down the number of weeds. That isn't to say that it's uh, all no maintenance because there's maintenance to everything. And in this particular picture, which is sun, uh, there's interesting things, there's sedums. So many, many varieties of sedums and they make great ground covers for sun. And there are a lot of peonies here. There are bulbs. And as we progress through this, you'll see a few bulbs, I think, in these pictures. And do remember that um, some of these bulbs are part of the ground cover. And now is the greatest time and the greatest selection to go ahead and get those in the ground. Now, the yellow uh, spiky form that you see in the background is a perennial called Baptisia. Okay, and in the next picture, uh, this is something that I have to have. It's not in full bloom here because the peonies are in bloom and it comes a little after that is a, a sort of a sea of lavender. I have to have lavender. It is not the easiest plant to grow. And it is, believe it or not, a wonderful ground cover. When it is in bloom, it is magnificent. It is so fragrant. And if you cut back those blooms down to the foliage, uh, after it's finished, you can even save the spent blooms and it keeps that fragrance. And it is, it's just delightful. Making potpourri, I put some in a container. There's still a container sitting above my sink right now and it's very fragrant. Then it'll rebloom in the fall, not as heavily, 
as in the spring, but in the fall. Uh, this is a plant that requires incredibly good drainage. And, and so this is the top of the slope and I worked a lot of small pea gravel and, and uh, organic matter into what was heavy clay and it's thriving and I'm thrilled. Okay, let's get into some of the things that you think of as more traditional ground covers. We need to think about sun because a lot of people have sunny areas and a lot of people have slopes. The two pictures that you saw in the beginning are actually a very steep slope that is right on the border of my property. And with permission, I planted it because they were trying to mow it and it was not safe. And yet it needed something to hold the soil to keep down erosion. So all of these things, think in terms of that, keeps down erosion. And a lot of them will keep you from mowing areas that are not safe. And actually, though I started that garden area many years ago, it is so popular right now because it's all about the birds, bees, and butterflies. And, and that is all about the birds, bees, and butterflies. Okay, let's talk about this one. Sunshine. All right, you come into the garden center and you look at the, the little ticket above these plants and it says full sun. That's not totally uh, the answer. Full sun, yes, but it will also take complete morning sun or very, very strong dappled light through the day. I have had great luck with this juniper. Juniper, this happens to be my favorite. It is very soft, it's not prickly, and it's blue Pacific. And guess what? What you see in the background are the mother plants, and it is growing in a slightly raised bed. And this is beside the road, and there is a large area of asphalt in front of that. Before you get to the road, I would say that there's a good 15, maybe 20 feet. This juniper has grown from those mother plants on top of the asphalt, and it's absolutely beautiful. I just took this picture two or three days ago. It's all green. The leaves have settled into there over the years, and so there's organic matter that it's growing in. I never water it. Can you believe this is growing on asphalt? Yes, it is. So we know it's hardy, don't we? It's a wonderful plant, a wonderful plant for the front of the border. Now it creeps, okay? So we're, bear in mind that you don't wanna put it right next to a path because it can grow out into the path, okay? Another juniper that I also enjoy, and it is a little prickly, but not bad, um, is Procumbens nana, N-A-N-A, -A -N -A, Procumbens nana. And I actually have these growing in containers and have been in that container same container for at least five years and it is thriving. I, I love some evergreens in containers to go through winter, but this one goes through period, okay? Now the next one is a fun one. And, and not everybody uh, would do this, but this actually is taken here at the garden center just a couple of weeks ago. And it's creeping thyme, T-H-Y-M-E, the herb creeping time. Many years ago on a, a trip with the perennial plant con convention, um, I saw in a landscape architect's garden, his entire lawn was a mixture of various creeping times. It was delightful. It isn't something you want to play basketball on or get out and, and do whatever on but it takes a, a, a limited amount of foot traffic and it's tremendous and it gets so thick that there really are very few weeds that come through it. So that's pretty interesting, you know? Okay, Danny, let, we'll have to continue with these because I've got a lot of pictures today. Here's another fun one. 
And it can do a little bit of a meltdown if it gets really, really hot. But if you trim it back, it pops right back. It's lamb's ear. And, and this particular one is um, big, big ears, I believe. But anyway, it's wonderful. It is semi-evergreen. It's pretty effective even through the winter. And just to touch those leaves. Oh, the children love this because they can touch those leaves. Now, this one is also in our garden out front here at Fair Oaks location. And it is a complete ground cover there bordering liriope. And you're going to hear a fair amount about liriope in this program, okay? And the next one is a very unusual one. I should have done a close-up of this because... Um, it's difficult to see the charm of it. It's rubus, R-U-B-U-S, rubus, calcinoides, okay? And it forms a wonderful ground cover and is so dense that very few weeds come through this. Now, that one was started in the bed there from just a few little plantings and this is bordering my driveway, which is gravel, and, um, and it's creeping out. So before long, I definitely will be passing over it with the car. Uh, not really, I'll, I'll move some of it before that. But I absolutely love this. And, and growing within it um, are some of the, the late blooming allium. So they're really fun. So this is Rubus calcinoides, okay? All right, now let's give a go with the liriope. I know people throw brick bats at liriope and they say, oh, it's so common. This is, this is not so good. I think it's fantastic, okay? It serves so many purposes in my garden. Okay, I've got a big garden. But even if you have a townhouse garden, what you do is see the things that you like along life's way. And you plant those. And you can use some of these ideas even in small situations, okay? Uh, with liriope, I use it as in mass sometimes. But primarily, it's used as a border, which I hope you can determine that it is a complete border here along the beds all around the front. But not only there, but in other places in my yard too. That way, I don't have to edge the beds, okay? All that you ever have to do for liriope is print it back in, and at late March is the best time. And you can run the lawnmower over it on high, three inches. Just don't wait too long or you'll get the new growth and you don't want to do that. So it's beautifully green. It grows in sun, it grows in shade, it grows in dry, it grows in slightly moist. You just can't beat it. And it's wonderful on slopes. And it can be mixed with other things. Bear in mind as I'm talking to you about these ground covers that they can be a part of your garden around other things. On what is my left, as I'm looking at this picture, there is at my foundation, Pacassandra. And that is another one that people throw brick bats at. It's too common. Well, nothing is common when you use it differently. And so, Coming out of that bed of Pacassandra, there are very few weeds, but coming out of that are beautiful hosta, a still bee, and other things that keep that Pacassandra from being mundane. It's very interesting and it serves a major purpose and it's very evergreen. Okay, there is a native one. Yes, there is. I don't have the patience to wait for the native one to do what this Pacassandra does for me, okay? So we all have our opinions and, and you just got mine. I love the native one. It's beautiful. 
And if you have a really small space, by all means do it. It's lovely. But I have big spaces and I need coverage. And in the next picture, you will actually see a close up of the border that you saw in the, in the picture before. And this is, by the way, when the alliums are in bloom, the large flowered alliums. And now is the time to do that. Yes, they are, they cost a little more money, but oh my gosh, when they come into bloom, they're just magnificent and you're so glad you did it. So they can be in and among what really in this area are ground covers too. I'm going to be doing a two-part series really in shade gardening because most of my garden is shade. And even though, as I said, you have a small garden, it's okay because you just adapt to the things that you really like when you've got a small garden. So let's say that this entire bed is actually a ground cover. There are a lot of perennial, first there are a lot of bulbs, before these were the daffodils, and then the perennials came up and covered all that foliage, and now you've got the alliums coming up, but guess what? Yes, that is liriope. That is the border there. And, and as I said, I, I'm in love with it with liriope. Okay. okay, here, this is in my back garden, and it's near the, the deck, and, and this is one of those things that if you have a small garden and you have some shade, uh, a sun too, all these things will love more full morning sun. But the hostas will sometimes burn, particularly in August heat, in full sun. And all of these things love dappled light. So they'll take a lot of sun. They just don't particularly appreciate the very hottest sun particularly if it's hot and dry. But this is, is a bed that I have totally enjoyed. There are a lot of different hosta in this bed. Before you see this, there are bulbs in this bed. And there is a dryopterous fern. Guess what, the deer don't eat fern. It's Dryopteris brilliance because it comes out in the early spring and it is brilliant. It then settles into a greener form in the summer and then takes on a little more color and is evergreen in the winter. But what you're also seeing there is the complement of boxwood and uh, Japanese maple. So you've got a wonderful color pickup there. And, and you could take something like this and adapt it very easily to a small space. In the next um, picture is something that I have utilized heavily. And I didn't do it on my own, Helleborus. I started many years ago planting Helleborus. And now I have a tremendous number of Helleborus. What a great, great ground cover. Because they're very promiscuous. They seed themselves about prolifically, and I love it. If it's too much for you, it's very easy to get rid of them. But the deer don't eat Helleborus, and they frequently come into bloom in January, and they can bloom well through April. And even after that, the blossoms are still attractive. The only thing that you have to do for Helleborus is cut back the old leaves um, when the new growth begins to come up. And that's usually in January on a pretty day. Now, I have to tell you that I don't do that to everything because I would if it were up close and personal but a lot of this is, is in a larger area. And sometimes I just let those leaves go down and it becomes a ground cover protecting from additional weeds. Not that I have a lot of weeds in this Helleborus, okay? It's, it's uh, not weed free. And mixed in with that is Christmas fern, which is also 
uh, an evergreen. It will tolerate some dry. It does better if it's not really dry, but it certainly will tolerate drought. Now, the deer do not eat the Halloboros and they do not eat the fern. And in the next picture, you'll see uh, a almost complete ground cover of Helleborus. This is a bed that's loaded with um, daffodils that are going to come into play soon, because this is actually, this may be a summertime picture. So they have probably come and gone at this point. But in this area where it gets dappled light throughout the day, and there's actually two pathways that separate this, and they're all permeable pathways, by the way. I use the red Seminole uh, chips for my paths, and I just love it. I don't ever use pea gravel as uh, a path cover because it, I can't push my wheelbarrow through it easily, and, and I don't walk through it easily. But these little Seminole chips are rough edged a little bit and you have great traction with those. So if you're thinking in terms of doing something in pathways that's fairly inexpensive, you can put down some landscape fabric and then put this small gravel on top of it. And I've done it for years and I really do love it. You have to replenish it every now and then because I do, yes, I'm guilty. I do blow some leaves, but I do, try to do it gently. And, and you're gonna lose a little bit of it when you do that, but uh, replacing small amounts of it now and then is not difficult, okay? And then the next picture, you're going to see some of these older varieties in bloom. And this happens to be across my creek area where it can just take off and do whatever it wants to because there's plenty of space back there. I don't, I really don't garden back in that area particularly, but it has all the droppings of the oak trees and, and that becomes wonderful compost. And I do back in that area compost all of my leaves because that helps me grow a much more beautiful garden and it's ecologically pleasing too, okay. Now, here, here's another ground cover. And some of these ostilbes will also reseed. Um, I've got numerous varieties of the um, ostilbe. Here it is within the border, opposite of the earlier border that you saw. And there are azaleas in the background. It gets a fair amount of sunshine, but not the hottest afternoon. Well, briefly, but briefly is fine. And, and so you can, you can differentiate the, the various plants there. The, in the front is that border of liriope and the a group, large group of a stilby and different um, hosta there. So you can throw together these combinations with these ground covers. Hopefully I'm introducing you maybe to some that you haven't used before, but using them in combination with other things can be very interesting. And in the next picture, actually, this is from that very same area. And again, there are azaleas in the background this is the liriope when it is in bloom and it's very attractive. And by the way, you can actually, they're short, they're gonna be six to eight inches tall. You can actually pick those and they're nice in bouquets inside. And the fern that's rising out of that is a cinnamon fern. And right now it has grown up its spikes and it's very interesting. Now it is not evergreen, okay? It will die back over the winter time. Now, the next picture is getting into some grasses or what I would think of as grasses and they're not true grasses. And this one is obviously not in my garden, but there is a complete massive border here in the front of some very interesting evergreens, um, different varieties, because this is a public garden. Um, Brooke, Brooklands is not right, down in South Carolina. 
I can't think of the, the exact name of it, but anyway, it was a wonderful garden to visit there near the coast in South Carolina, near, near Myrtle Beach. And um, this is a mass that's probably 18 to maybe 20 inches wide, and it's the mid-size Mondo grass, M-O-N-D-O, Mondo grass. I love this grass. It is fantastic. And that, again, is in a public garden. Brook Green, thank you, Danny. Isn't it wonderful, this technology? He just popped that right, right up. Brook Green Garden, sculpture garden, actually, but it's a wonderful plants garden also. So if you're ever in that area, I did it tell you the name of the, because we should do public gardens you pick up a lot of ideas from public gardens. It's wonderful. But this is a great use of a ground cover. Hardly anything would come through that. And in the next picture, it's actually utilized in my own garden in a much smaller way, of course. And this is, again, a border. And this one is probably a foot wide. And it's in front of some boxwood and mixed with fern. And here again, this is an entire little area that the deer don't do anything with, thank goodness, you know. And the following picture is a chorus, A-C-O-R-U-S, a chorus minimus, dwarf a chorus. And this one will actually take some ground that's slightly moist, which is interesting. Rising out of that is a hellebores, okay. This is a golden color. It will take, as I said, most of these things will all take full, full morning sun, but this one really wouldn't appreciate the, the hottest sun in the afternoon. And coming back to me, let, let me just show you here. Yeah, here we go. This is a little starter plant of that, of course. And if you're planting this, here's a thought. You can put it in exactly as it is, but in good soil, if you lift this, and <laughs> it's, uh, it's root bound. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pull these roots off the bottom. I'm gonna pull this out. When you're planting these things, you want to be very sure, this is why my fingernails are always dirty, whatever. Uh, you loosen up the roots, like so, when you're planting these things. You don't destroy that root system, but you certainly open it up. But here is something else that you can do. And I didn't bring a knife up here. I should have any. Let's see if I'm strong enough to do this. I think so. All right. I want to show you what you can do with some of these things, with liriope, with the mondo grasses, with this one. Well, this, there we go. I made a mess, but that's all right. I can clean it up. Look what happens with this. I've got all these baby plants right now. And if I gently pull it apart, you can now plant these closely or six inches. And before long, you'll have a nice patch of this. Look how many you can get from that one little plant. This is a perennial. It is evergreen and it's delightful. It's wonderful in containers. I've used it a lot in, in my little, um, oriental type containers or with my dwarf evergreens but in the front of a bed this it's spectacular look at this i can sit here and look what you've done you've got all those babies and all that mess okay i think i already showed you because i think this is exciting look the roots are masked that's okay I always have a knife on hand, and I usually have my George chins on hand, and would you believe I didn't put them up here today, didn't? But you could loosen those things up, okay? Because you don't want to plant it tight like that. 
it'll just grow around in circles and, and, and won't do well. So you open all of this up. And if I had my Joyce chins, I would cut that. I don't think I'm gonna be as lucky, but you can see these little offsets there. You can do the same thing with this Mondo grass. It's incredible. All right, Danny, let's keep going, baby. <laughs> Next one up. Here's another one. There we go. Here's another one that's often underused. It's epimedium. E-P-I-M-E-D-I-U-M. Epimedium. There's different varieties of this. One of my absolute favorites is sulfurium because the foliage is somewhat variegated. And this is in my own garden. I love it as a ground cover. Now it doesn't like the hottest afternoon sun either. And it does bloom briefly in usually late February, early March. And the only thing you need to do for epimedium is to put on your calendar to go out in February and totally cut back the foliage that doesn't look good because it's it's evergreen, so to speak. But by February, that foliage does not look good. So cut it back. And then you'll get these spikes of delicate flowers and it's just beautiful. But if you leave the old foliage up, the flowers don't look so spectacular, okay? But it is evergreen. It can grow, my mind is growing around azaleas and boxwood and fern and, and all of that wonderful stuff. So epimedium, it's fantastic. And another one that I use extensively, and this is a small shrub. Actually, the taller shrub um, is, is wonderful too. It's Pieris japonica. And it thrives, it'll take full sun, but I don't grow mine in full sun because when you do, it is like azaleas. It is very susceptible to some bugs and, and I don't want them. You know, I, I, I'm not anti-chemical, but I am really low use of any chemicals. I, that's why I like Merrifield Garden Center. We have people who can tell you which ones to use and, and how to use it judiciously, okay? So I, d I don't want to spray my things. I don't, I don't spray them. If something decides to die, it just has to go ahead and die. And I find something else. But this is Pierre's Japonic. But what we're talking about today is the ground cover that is beneath it. And it's Sarkoa. S-A-R-C-O-C-C-A, Sarkoko, -C -C Sweet Box. It is beautifully evergreen, and it has very fragrant flowers in January, February, and is the most wonderful ground cover. But you can see, you can use these things in mass by themselves, or you can use them in combination with other things. The first time that I ever saw Sarkakoa in use was many, many years ago at Longwood Gardens. And they had a huge expanse of this up at the top of a hill, if you've ever been to Longwood Gardens, and if you haven't, you should, uh, near the fountain that comes up and, and goes down the hill into the lovely pond. Sarkakoa, it is fantastic. And it's probably maxes out at around two to two and a half feet. So it's not a, a ground hugger per se. And there's another unusual one in the next picture. And this one at first for me was a little temperamental, but it hasn't been lately. And I mean, for a long time, it's a saxifraga. S-A-X-I-F-R-A-G-I-A-S-A-X-F-A-G-R-I-A. -A -A. Um, some people call it strawberry begonia, but it is definitely not a begonia. And it makes a marvelous ground cover in, in shade. 
Um, it again would take morning sun, but not afternoon sun. And it's growing here with a border of liriope that's just coming up after I'd cut it back and, and surrounded by fern. And, and it's very, very attractive ground cover. It does bloom, sends up delicate little blossoms and, and is wonderful. In the next picture, you perhaps have never grown this as a ground cover. And it's native, by the way. Uh, it's a type of true geranium. It's mycorrhizum. I'm not sure I can spell that name. <laughs> mycorrhizum, okay. And it forms a beautiful ground cover. It is incredibly fragrant blossom, not blossoms, it does blossom. It blossoms usually in April. But it's it's saving grace is number one, the deer don't eat it. And um, it's quasi evergreen, not as strong in the wintertime, but it's there. But the foliage is so fragrant. It is just wonderful. Now, Danny, I know you're looking that up for me, but you, you, again, you'll bring back to me for just a moment. You'll tell them later. Okay. I snitched this out of one of our containers down in the perennial section because it's loaded with it. It's all this, okay. This is the top of the plant. This is what is in the soil, partly in, partly out. You can divide this every now and then. This is the root system. And so it's easy to separate this periodically as it grows densely for you. And you can just simply cover this with a couple of inches of soil. But that, that is the leaf. And it's oh, so fragrant. It's kind of dandy. Tell me if you like that. Mm -hmm. Now, some people like it and some don't, but I do. I have a feeling. Did you, did you get the spelling? I on believe so. Macroriza. M-A-C. M-A-C. R-O-R. R-O-R. R-H-I. R-H-I. Z-U-M. Z-U-M. Okay, you got it. That's the one you want. Now I'm going to tell you about another fern. Danny, we have to bring this one up next. This is in my own garden. And sometimes things do happy things that I didn't plan at all. I, I had, I think, um, this was a long time ago. Um, I think some development was going on in the area and I had a little spring pop up in this area. I, that's my justification because what had not been moist before all of a sudden was. And I have this native, it is a native fern. Okay, uh, it's ostrich fern, ostrich fern. And I have it growing in my garden. And somehow it's seeded into this area. I lost several things that really wanted it more dry. And then everything that liked it slightly moist is thriving. I have this huge Burford holly there, which is, is delightful uh, for me because I like where it is. It's not on the corner of my house where I have to uh, prune it every now and then. And out to the out away from this slightly is, is a lot of camellias, which are coming into bloom right now, by the way. So this is an entire mass of ostrich fern. No, it is not perennial. And it will go down shortly. And I sort of leave the fronds on it because it's protection over the winter and becomes a part of a natural mulch. It actually doesn't look too bad. And if, if you felt that it did, you could throw some mulch on top of it. It certainly wouldn't hurt anything and it would, it would look good for you perhaps, but I do really enjoy this fern and I just let it go. It can be rampant in certain areas. So you wanna be careful how you use it. You don't wanna put it in a border that you want to be tidy because it is not tidy and it does, send out runners, but this is surrounded all the way around with something that keeps it from moving out of that area. So it's great. Now I'm, I'm going to show you in the next picture, 
I showed you the front, you know, that we're going backwards. But, um, I showed you the, the picture of the, the front part of the garden where I had used Liriope as a border. Now this is a back portion of my garden. And as I said, you can say, oh my goodness, you've got all this space. I don't have that kind of space. Yes, you have space. You take for that space the things that you like. And if you have something in that space that you don't like, and it's a small space, get rid of it. Put something in that you do like, because life is too short not to have things that you don't like, okay? Okay, this is masses in certain areas of Pacassandra. In certain areas, there's also the border of either that medium-sized mondo grass, or in some cases, I have used what I will, what I didn't bring up. Huh. Oh, I did. The LV Pogo. I'm not ready to go to this yet, but thank you. I'm going to show them later. Mm. Um, so there is a lot of Pacassandra here. Rising out of the one on my, my left is a lot of Lukothawe and azaleas and dogwood and redbud. And there are bulbs in those areas. The big bulbs are strong enough to come through this. The, the dwarfer forms, no, you would not plant in Pakistan. Okay. And looking straight on at this, there's some beautiful Japanese maple and a few other evergreens that are rising out of this combination of the mass to one side of Loriope and then the Pacassandra on the other side. So I just want to show you how you can use these products that we think of as, un as common in a different way and they're no longer common. So I, I, I enjoy them. They're, they're utilitarian for me. I don't have to weed in that area. There's almost nothing that comes through it. And then the following picture is another one that's used rarely. And this one is, is not evergreen, okay? It's polygonatum, P-O-L-Y-G-A-N-A-T-U-M. I think that's close. Solomon seal is the kind of name, but it's the variegated Solomon seal. And when it's growing well and in good soil, it can stand two and a half to three feet tall. It arches, it arches all pretty much in the same direction. It has attractive little tiny blossoms in the spring, but its claim to fame is the mass of this variegated foliage and the deer so far have not, that's not the first thing that they go after, okay? I can't say that they haven't eaten it, but it's not the first thing that they go after. It's, it's absolutely delightful. If we can come back to me for just a minute, uh, Danny. This is another one that I did not take a picture of. I do have pictures. And when I go into those shade gardening uh, Zoom programs, you'll see more combinations of things. This one is Ophia Pogon. Ophia Pogon. And it is a dark, wonderful color. O-P-H-I-O-P-O-G-O-N. Ophia Pogon. This one's called Blackbeard, but there, there's two or three different black ones. And what a nice combination it is. Um, you combine it with the green, it's attractive. You could even uh, combine it with this, the foliage. I love the contrast of foliage in this. And there would this would be a little taller. This could be massed in small masses. Oh, really wonderfully interesting. But um, actually, I, I want to mention first, this is a fantastic time to do these bulbs. And I love to mask the, the grape hyacinths. Now, people say they're deer resistant. The bulb is, and the bloom is. 
But with this particular one, the foliage will come up in the fall and they'll munch on the foliage. All right, talking all about that, I have to, I have to mention this. I couldn't survive with, without it. Um, I spray with Bobex and there are several good ones downstairs and a number of our customers alternate, okay? But I use this pretty consistently and it works for me with everything except Bambi. And I think that mama didn't tell them early enough that they're not supposed to eat this stuff, okay? Dear, it's really wonderful. I use it more frequently in the spring when you're constantly getting new growth out of things because the rain doesn't wash it off. But I do use this on the susceptible plants. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to garden. Okay, Danny, my grand finale, before we have time for just a few questions. Okay, uh, I'd call it a folly, except it's not a building. So let's call it whimsical. There are areas within the garden that can be problematical sometimes. Maybe they stay too moist. In this particular area, I couldn't grow grass well because it was very, very shady. And I did have, have walkways with the large stones in some areas. And I put down the landscape fabric. And then on top of that, I put the, the small river rock. Actually, it's a combination of the three eighths inch, but I think up from that is three fourths inch maybe. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of those two. And, and yeah, you have to replenish it every now and then. And actually I've hit the point where I need to replenish some of it between those stones so that they're not trippers. Um, oh, I decided, okay, I'm going to do something fun because my husband would come racing down that way with the lawn clippings or the, the leaf clippings or whatever with the riding mower and go across the bridge and it was always mucky, and I didn't mind that. And so I formed this with stone in a couple of areas, and I planted the dwarf mondo grass. The rounded balls that you see in the center are hypertufa balls that I created with the hypertufa over old Christmas balls, or for a larger one, over... Uh, a, an inexpensive rubber ball it needs a form and and then the moss because it's a moist area and then the moss came so that is my whimsical note for the day so i hope you have enjoyed this um ground covers presentation and that it has been somewhat enlightening perhaps because for me, the ground covers are anything but boring. Thank you, All right, Miss Sally. Thank you so much, Peg. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions that have come in. So just want to remind everybody, if we don't get to your question today, you're welcome to send us an email. And the easiest way to do that is to hit reply on that confirmation email that goes to me and I'll share it with Peg or I know some of you are mentioning some issues you're having with some of the plants Peg has mentioned. So that can go to the plant clinic. We can take care of you guys. Um, all right, Peg. So the first question we've got is, um, I live in a wooded area. Do you have a recommendation for a very low ground cover that would not provide a hiding place for snakes? <laughs> Challenge. Oh, honey. Uh, snakes can be anywhere. Okay, I, I don't, uh, I don't think there's anything that, that you could completely avoid with snakes. I grew up in rattlesnake country, and so snakes are not my fondest thing. That's for sure. Um, on my particular property, is very wooded, and I have a little stream that runs through it. But the amazing thing is, I, I don't seem to have a lot of snakes. I do have garner snakes and occasionally a black snake, both of which are gardening friends. And so in spite of the fact that I don't like them, I appreciate their presence 
and and no, I don't like surprises. I actually picked up a little garner snake in my hand accidentally out of a container, for goodness sakes. Yeah, he was eating slugs. So I had to say thank you and and throw him away, you know. But of course we do have some snakes that are that are poisonous, okay. Um, I couldn't really tell you in the shade, I'm looking around at these things, they're all tall enough that, that a snake would have no problem hiding in. So I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for that one. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of times wildlife tends to stump us. Um, all righty, next question. We've got a few questions coming in about like conditions for what plants are best for certain challenging conditions. So the first one is if you have really dry shade um, do you have any specific recommendations for that? I do. Um, once it's established, you have to water until things get established. But one that will truly take some dry shade after that, or that, there's more than one actually, is epimedium. Uh, I have found it to be even attractive where, particularly in August, this is beneath oak trees. Um, now, it's different with maple trees because your big maples, not the Japanese maples, but your big maples have a lot of surface roots. And it's really hard for things to thrive under that. Another one is beech. That's difficult. Um, there's very little understory plants in, in a beech forest because of the surface roots. So if you're battling that kind of dry shade, it's a challenge, you know? It might be even better to create uh, something that's attractive and make a sitting area or grow things in containers. But epimedium will take a lot of drought um, in the summertime or whatever. Now, another one that will take some drought is the Christmas fern. Some of the ferns like it to be slightly moist, but the Christmas fern will take it after that. And Loriopy will take just about anything that you throw at it, okay? So those are just some thoughts, okay? All right, thank you, Peg. Um, okay, next question is if you have really deep shade, what do you do if you get no sun at all? It's just shade all day. Uh, that's a little bit more of a challenge. I absolutely, here again, uh, some of the grasses, certainly as I said, Loriopy will absolutely grow just about anywhere, you know? Uh, and so you would try that. Again, you could try this, uh, believe it or not, this geranium will take a fair amount of shade. And um, the epimedium again will take some shade. It's amazing how much shade Helleborus will take. That's dappled light mostly where I grow that, but it would grow in a pretty, Pretty good bit of shade. Some of the ferns would do that well there. You can try those. Now, if this is shade beneath um, evergreens or total shade in the shade of a building, that hopefully you've got some reflected light coming into that. And, and there are certainly some of the ferns that will do well there. So give some of those things a try. All right, thanks, Peg. Um, next question is about slopes and I think being able to handle like some cleanup dealing with leaves. So this person, so this may be two separate challenges here. Um, this person is looking for a ground cover that can handle a 45 degree slope that's easy to clean up when you've got leaves and debris falling on it. It can handle that kind of conditions. So maybe two different. He didn't say sun or shade. No, no sun or shade. So if you want to ride back in, if you're still on the call, let us know if you're going for sun and shade. I'll keep an eye out. Well, well in, in, the, um, in the sunshine, actually those first couple of pictures, I don't truly rake all the leaves in that. And if it's in a small area, cleaning out the leaves is not a terribly big deal anyway. But um, I try to leave as many leaves in place if it's too thick, you'd, you'd rather bring them out and run the lawnmower over them and put them back in, okay? Um, but all of those things in that first picture, except no, not the, not the lavender. They don't want all that around them. 
but a lot of these grasses and 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 believe me i don't write the leaves out of my pachysandra they settle down into that and become a, a wonderful living mulch and nutrients for sometimes we clean up our gardens too well if if you can even leave some of things and and mulch on top of it if you're not happy with the look but as I said, sometimes we clean up too well because that's nature's way of replenishing the nutrients in your soil. I don't know that that's a satisfactory answer, but that's about the best I can do right now. That sounds good. Thank you. Um, here's a question for, since you're mentioning Pachysandra, how do you control Pachysandra from swallowing the lor liriope? They're both tough. Okay. So they, they seem to, I've had them in that area for years and, and I have not had an issue, okay? They, one is as tough as the other. And so they kind of say, okay, we're going to be friends. All right. Thanks, Peg. Okay, we've got a few more minutes. Let's see how many we can get to here. Um, here's a good question for everybody who's on this call. I think this is relevant to them. Uh, what is the cutoff date for planting in the fall? Is there any date past which you would say hold until the spring? Well, most of the time the garden center pretty much says as long as the ground isn't frozen, that's particularly for the shrubs and trees and whatever. When it's perennials, I like to get into the garden center and make those picks and get them into the ground as soon as possible so that they can begin to establish. Fortunately, even going into early November, the latter part of October into November, the ground is warmer than the air right now. And so they will go in and settle in somewhat. So with perennials, I like to get them in the ground as soon as possible in October or certainly no later than early November. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, do you recommend any particular fertilizers for ground covers, or is it on a basis of if I wish plant you're going to be adding? Maybe check with the plant clinic when you decide what you want. Well, right now, of course, you're going to get different answers from different people. Okay. Right now, if you're planting perennials, perennials particularly, you don't want to fertilize heavily. And in fact, if, if you grow them in reasonably decent soil, and I love to use my compost, and if you don't have that, we sell a product called Leaf Grow, which is composted leaves that I think is fantastic to work into your soil as you're planting these. But this is my go-to fertilizer. It is all natural. It's all organic. It's slow release. So you're not hitting these things with something that's going to promote fast growth, okay? In some areas, you might want that. In, in containers, perhaps you might want to use a Bloom Buster liquid fertilizer. But right now, because I'm dividing some of my perennials and redoing some areas that I have been working on recently, I use this according to the directions, plant on by a sponge. And then you can sprinkle that in around with them again in the spring. Or if you choose, we sell the Maryfield Garden Center um, inorganic fertilizer, and you can use that in the spring. But I think it's a little strong for using in the fall, where you're trying to promote root growth and not so much top growth, okay? Got it. All right, and I think we've got time for one more question. So this is the last one. Um, do you have any recommendations that you would plant on the edge of a wooded area besides the hellebores that you showed? Um, this person says your hellebores are beautiful and planting at the edge of a wooded area is a major challenge. Well, absolutely everything that I showed you today would love that situation unless it gets the hottest afternoon sun. And then you would have to go to uh, uh, the, the, the junipers, the times. But, but most of this stuff will take a reasonable amount of sun, okay? So I have a wooded area. It's primarily oak, but there are other things. There's wild cherry, there's tulip poplar, there's a lot of native plants. I have native dogwood, 
native French tree, native red bud. And these plants love it there. And on the border, they really love it. So um, unless it's getting the hottest of afternoon sun, any of these plants will do the job. All right, thank you so much, Peg. It is one o'clock now, so we will have to go ahead and wrap up. Um, quick reminder to everybody, if you have questions you haven't gotten answered, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, we can follow up with you. And Peg, is there anything you'd like to close with before we wrap up? Uh, well, not really, except uh, gardening is so incredibly therapeutic. And um, it brings me a lot of joy. There's so many wonderful choices. In one hour, you can only present a small number of those. So the things that I've presented today are just a limited number of what you might consider to be ground covers. I've enjoyed doing the presentation and I hope you've enjoyed watching. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Peg. Everybody have a good day. We will be sending out the recordings and a list of plants tomorrow. So everybody, thank you so much for being with us. Have a good day. Bye, Peg. Bye-bye.